Welcome to this very uh, unique um, discussion or maybe debate or we were debating already what we should call it and a lot of you said oh it sounds great it's called debate I said well actually <laughs> earlier on we were saying maybe it's more of an argument what do you think will get more interest I don't know <laughs> but anyway hopefully it can be um, interesting to hear from three different perspectives from uh, three different monastics in different bodies, with different minds and different experiences, but also to include everybody here as far as we can within the time we have to hear your views on um, what the Buddha thought about gender, where he placed this in his teachings, whether it was relevant or not, whether it had an, any bearing on a person's capacity for awakening or not, and um, what are maybe some of the conflicts and paradoxes around that you know because we can say gender doesn't matter at the ultimate level but what about at the actual level when it comes to having enough support for example to practice especially maybe as bhikkhunis um, and maybe for other people from other genders right so moving beyond this idea of gender binary and maybe into non-binary or even transgender people how can we create more inclusivity in buddhism is there a place for that so we wanted to look a little bit today at um, the historical context of uh, where the Buddha placed women in particular and uh, drawing on the text a little bit and also talk a bit about this idea of non-self because I don't know about you but I have heard it used sometimes almost as an excuse uh, not to pay attention to inequalities that may exist in our societies. You know, well, it's all non-self, so what does it matter if you're male or female or gay or, you know, heterosexual? shouldn't matter. True at the ultimate level, but what's the reality that we have to work with? And um, also we wanted to talk a bit about the role of women and maybe how we can bring Buddhism more into the contemporary society and keep up, at least, with, uh, with the social norms of today, because sometimes religions do seem to lag behind. And I think in a religion like Buddhism, which, where the Buddha, the founder of the religion, was so ahead of his day, you know, so ahead in terms of um, revolutionizing uh, the Sangha, really, for women, you know, going ahead of most religions, especially the Brahmanical religions of the time. And yet, in modern day Buddhism, we're often behind the times, which seems rather ironic and can actually, um, I think, turn people away from an interest in the teachings that actually are supposed to lead to our freedom, not to our, uh, to our kind of suppression, if you like, right? Not to a lack of opportunity. So that's uh, quite a big subject, and we have no idea really where it's going to go, which is interesting. And um, we have here, of course, Ajahn Brahmali, who's come over all the way from... Poland, but from Australia, <laughs> via Poland, <laughs> okay. um, to be here. And he is known, really, as a fantastic ally to the Bhikkhuni Sangha, who's done a lot of research into ways to make the ordination possible, as the Buddha did, and as the Buddha ensured would, would be the case uh, into the modern day. And also, he's a spiritual friend of ours. We practice together. We have the same teacher in Perth, Ajahn Brahm. And he's here to support our project, our Nukampa Bikuni project, which aims to give women in this country an opportunity to take the full ordination, if they wish, right? Because I think it's about having a choice. And then we also have Venerable Upeka, who took her Bikuni ordination with me the same day, pretty much the same time, nine minutes sooner. <laughs> and, uh, and we lived together for three or four years in Perth. And uh, she's come over to help me out with the project here. And it will be interesting to hear her perspective as someone who maybe didn't ordain initially um, really thinking much about bhikkhuni ordination because for many uh, Buddhist women, we don't even conceive it as a possibility, but then later got that opportunity and has been living as a bhikkhuni for nearly 10 years now. So um, we all have slightly different experiences and perspectives on this and hopefully we'll all have something to add. So, um, I wanted to start by going straight to the texts, actually. And this is called the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, which is part of the connected discourses uh, in the Tipitaka, the Sutta Pitaka. 
And it's the Bhikkhuni Samyutta. So this is a chapter all about uh, monastic women in the Buddha's day. And these bhikkhunis, these uh, female nuns or monastics, many of them were enlightened. And yet they were still challenged from time to time as they set about their practice. So I want to read this one in particular because this was, uh, it talks about gender. And uh, I'll just go for it. So this is with the bhikkhuni Soma. Then the nun Soma, robed up in the morning, <coughs> and taking her bowl and robe, entered Savati for alms. She wandered in alms in Savati, and after the meal, on her return from alms round, she went to the blind man's grove, plunged deep into it, and sat at the root of a tree for the day's meditation. Then Mara the wicked, wanting to make the non Soma feel fear, terror, and goosebumps, wanting to make her fall away from samadhi, that stillness or deep uh, unity of mind, uh, went up to her and addressed her in verse. That state's very challenging. It's for the sages to attain. It's not possible for a woman with her two-fingered wisdom. Then the nun Soma thought, who's speaking this verse, a human or a non-human? Then she thought, this is Mara the wicked, wanting to make me feel fear, terror, and goosebumps, wanting to make me fall away from Samadhi. Then Soma, knowing that this was Mara the wicked, replied to him in verse, what difference does womanhood make when the mind is serene and knowledge is present, as you rightly discern the Dhamma? Surely someone who might think, I am a woman, or I am a man, or I am anything at all is fit for Mara to address. Then Mara the wicked, thinking the non Soma knows me, miserable and sad, Sometimes it says dejected and shoulders slumped, which I really like, because you can just see him mm, vanished right there. <laughs> so I think this is a very beautiful verse. And uh, just two little points I'd like to make about it was, first of all, that uh, it was Mara who challenged her and who said, you know, how can a woman attain that state, which means the awakened state? That was Mara, that wasn't the voice of wisdom, right? It wasn't the Buddha, surely. <laughs> um, so this was actually Mara the wicked, which is supposed to be a personification of our negativities, if you like, of, our, um, uh, of the defilements of the mind, and also a being that wants to stop us from progressing to enlightenment. So he comes at her with this kind of, uh, this kind of view, wrong view. But she notices that this is Mara and takes no notice whatsoever because she's seen right through those identities of being a woman or a man or anything at all, right? There's simply no identification with the body or with the mind. So she said, and it's only someone who identifies in that way, I am a woman or I am a man or I am anything at all who's fit for Mara to address. So... Such a statement can't shake somebody who's seen through these things. So what I think is interesting about this, and maybe why I chose it to start the discussion, is because we can say this is the case at the ultimate level. But then, is that really the case at the apparent level, at the level of society, the level of the conditions we're actually working with? Because it shouldn't matter, and yet sometimes it does, right? Sometimes we don't have the same opportunities. Sometimes... You know, I mean, not just to speak for women, but what about, say, transgender people who want to join the Buddhist Sangha? Do they have the opportunity or not? So sometimes there's this kind of uh, seeming paradox between the ultimate and the, the actual, or the, you know, the conditioned reality, if you like, and kind of speaking in, like, idealistic terms. And I think it's important to address this today. So, <laughs> and sort it out once and for all. <laughs> so, enough for me for now, and I'd love to hand over to the other uh, monastics. And Ajahn Brahmali is actually an expert in the Buddhist suttas. He's rather a scholar. Um, 
Right. And I would love to hear mm -hmm. from you, Ajahn, mm -hmm. about uh, yeah. what you think some of the Buddha's views were and, and maybe why yeah. there do seem to be some discriminative passages in the text and whether that's really the word of the Buddha or not. What would you say <laughs> about yeah. that? Yeah. And I think that is something that needs to be addressed because when you, when you read the suttas, they come across passages that are a bit, uh, look a bit dodgy. Yeah? They look like, you know, who spoke these passages? Did the Buddha awaken one really say such negative things about women or whatever? And it seems kind of, to me, very unlikely because if you have compassion and kindness, uh, some of these passages actually seem quite harsh. Uh, but I, let me get back to that one. I, I, I want to start to talk sure. a little bit about uh, the idea of how Buddhism transforms as it moves around the world. Uh, because often the question is, should we have, you know, what are the right way of uh, moving with Buddhism when Buddhism goes from one culture to another culture, from one era to another era? What should we transform? What should we change? What should we kind of leave as it is? Uh, and one of the interesting things, of course, about uh, Buddhism uh, as it moves around the world, it goes from one place to another one, uh, is that it always changes uh, when it moves. Uh. So if you look at Buddhism, for example, in uh, India or Sri Lanka, the way it is there, and you compare it to Buddhism in China, there are actually quite significant differences, at least on the surface of things, right? Uh, the differences are there. Uh. And you can see obvious things like, um, you know, like, for example, the, uh, the stupas, uh, you know about the stupas, right? The stupas in ancient India, they were just a mound of earth to begin with, uh, and they became more and more complicated. And today, if you want to see some really nice stupas in India, go to Sanchi. Uh, have you heard about Sanchi? Uh, have you, has anyone been to India here before? Uh, yes, been to India? Okay, cool. Okay, so this is an extra site. You can go, go in India because you have the ordinary holy sites where the Buddha was, uh, where he was born, where he was awakened, where he uh, uh, gave his first discourse, and where he passed away. These are the normal four. Uh, but there are many other interesting sites in India. One of them is Sanchi, uh, you know, these beautiful stupas, uh, and they are kind of more advanced stupas, but they still have that shape of a stupa, a kind of semi, uh, semi-sphere, or whatever you want to call it. Uh. And then you go to China, and you have these towers, uh, yeah, these kind of enormous towers. They're called pagodas, uh, but actually they are just an evolution of the stupa in Chinese culture. Uh. And when you see the Chinese monastics, they dress very differently because the climate is very cold in China compared to India. The monasteries are very different, often large monasteries. Uh, you go to Tibet, you can see very different kinds of monasteries. Uh. And so many, many things change as uh, uh, Buddhism moves around the world. Uh. And of course, teachings also change. Uh, if you go to China, you find very different uh, uh, suttas, uh, Mahayana suttas, for example, compared to the early suttas of Buddhism. Uh, so the very interesting question arises uh, when so much changes, uh, and now we are kind of seeing the movement into what Western world or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so what is an acceptable change uh, and what is not an acceptable change? Uh, right? It's a kind of very significant question. What can we change when Buddhism moves around the world and what can we not change? Uh, because if we change uh, the wrong things, uh, we end up throwing out the whole of uh, essence of what Buddhism is about, right? Uh, and this is one of the kind of famous arguments is about the argument about rebirth, for example. Should we throw out rebirth? Is it just a cultural trapping of the ancient Asia? Or is it actually something significant, the idea of rebirth? Uh, yeah, these kind of things. Uh, so what can we change uh, and what can't we change? This becomes one of those very critical questions to ask. Uh, and the answer, of course, is that we read, if you understand the word of the Buddha, uh, you start to understand precisely what can change and what can't. Uh, because there are certain things that are fundamental to these teachings. Uh, there are certain things that if you do them, uh, you have basically destroyed uh, your monastic life. Uh, and there are other things that actually the Buddha himself uh, was flexible about. Uh, yeah? So what can we change? What can't we do? What we cannot change is, for example, rebirth, right? Uh, this is what kind of was arguing with Stephen Bachelor about. Yeah, rebirth, that, keep rebirth. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, you are just destroying the whole purpose of this path. Uh. But uh, when it comes to things like ordination of, of uh, women uh, yeah, in Buddhism, uh, actually the Buddha, just as Bhandabha Chanda was saying, he was a foreigner, he was a revolutionary. Uh, he was someone who actually started this whole thing. Uh. So it's kind of crazy that we should hold back on something that the Buddha actually established. Uh. Buddhism was a, uh, one of the very few religions, most religions in the world have been very patriarchal. I mean, we know that they've always kind of been very male-dominated. Uh, but Buddhism was the one that from the very beginning uh, allowed women a reasonable uh, equality within its uh, kind of structure. Uh, and that is astonishing. Uh, and for us to kind of forget about that and throw it out and say, actually, it doesn't really, uh, you know, it doesn't apply, it's kind of 
madness in a certain way. Uh, and especially when Buddhism is now kind of moving out of its uh, heartland uh, in certain Asian cultures like uh, Thailand or Sri Lanka, whatever. Of course, in those cultures, the, this change is going to be more slow because of the, uh, the cultural, the, the kind of the heritage from the past, all these kind of things. Uh, and I think in the West, we shouldn't kind of tell people what to do in Asia, obviously. They have to do things their own way. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, now that Buddhism does come to the West, uh, we should ask how should we adapt Buddhism in an acceptable way, such as to fit better in with Western culture. If we don't do that, uh, we are doing Buddhism a disservice, uh, because Buddhism, as again Venerable Chanda was saying, will not survive, it won't thrive in the Western context unless we adapt those things that are adaptable, uh, yeah, that we actually allow for those things. And, in a Western uh, context, the sense of uh, equality of opportunity, uh, giving people a chance, whether it is women or transgender people or non-binary people or whatever it is, uh, is actually very significant. Uh, so we should make an effort. Uh, we should try our very best to understand these teachings uh, well enough to find out whether it is possible uh, to do these things. Uh, and we should not have a kind of knee-jerk, uh, conservative, traditional reaction to say it is impossible simply because it hasn't been done in the past. Uh, and this is, to me, the right attitude. And when you do that, you start to read what the Buddha said, you find some passages that are very, very much in favor of the idea of Buddhist monast female monastics, yeah? Buddhist uh, bhikkhunis, uh, as we would call them. And one of those passages is found in the famous uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which you, will, well, Venerables here, will all know about. Uh, and I mention this also, uh, I mention this sutta all the time, so uh, it's kind of a really fascinating sutta, because it can, kind of brings together so many of the aspects of what true Buddhism is about in one place. Yeah? This sutta is the sutta where the Buddha talks about his last journey to his passing away. Uh, and he kind of, because it is his last journey, and because he knows that, uh, he brings out uh, all these essential things, tells society, tells the monastic sangha, tells the lay people how they should survive after his passing away, what his teachings really are, what, how they should think about these things. Uh. And in that sutta, there is another conversation with Mara. Yeah, Mara is always there. Mara is bad, right? And Mara is really <laughs> dodgy. Always trying to kind of get his sneak, his hands, and do evil things. So, and always, and so there, Mara goes to the Buddha. And he says to the Buddha, yeah, okay, you've done enough bad things now, Buddha. Because Mara didn't like the Buddha very much, right? Uh, he didn't actually say that precisely, but you know, you get the kind of ballpark. And so he says to the Buddha, maybe it's time for you now to pass away, yeah? Because passing away, when you have done everything you shall do, or you're supposed to do, then it's time to pass away. Huh? So what are the things that you were supposed to do? Huh? Well, Mara says, you know, when you were first enlightened or awakened, uh, you told me that when the Bhikkhu Sangha and the Bhikkhu Nisangha are strong, yeah? when they are knowledgeable, uh, when they understand the teachings, uh, when they have penetrated and understood these teachings in a deep way, uh, when they're able to teach these teachings, elucidate them to other people, and they're able to kind of refute the dodgy views in the world. Yeah? So they can kind of set the record straight if there's a problem or whatever. Uh, when this is the case, uh, then I will pass away. Uh. So from that passage, uh, it is fairly obvious that the Buddha had the idea from the very beginning uh, to establish a bhikkhuni sangha. Yeah? It was part of the plan from the very beginning. Yeah? So, uh, and, and that is kind of fascinating because it goes against kind of very much of how we often think about the Buddhist teachings. Uh, very often the argument is made that the Buddha had to be persuaded to ordain the bhikkhunis. Uh, but actually, as far as I can tell, he actually wanted them from the beginning because he realized without it, uh, there will be an imbalance in Buddhism. Uh, and then he said, also interesting for all of you here, he said the same thing about the lay people, right? The, the lay women, the lay men, exactly the same thing. They should also have that same insight into Buddhism to be able to live in the same way. But the bhikkhun is there. All the four assemblies, the four parisas are there. Yeah, male and female, uh, monastic and non-monastic. Yeah. So that is kind of really uh, essential and a very, very important part of these Buddhist teachings. So the Buddha went against most of the social norms of the time. Uh, the prevailing society at that time was a Brahmanical society. Uh, it was a very kind of patriarchal kind of society. Uh, and he said that, uh, I, you know, I will not follow these norms. Uh, and for us then to become conservative uh, and not take into account uh, the Buddha's kind of uh, um, 
revolutionary or a non-traditional way of doing things would be wrong. If you want to be good disciples of the Buddha, we should follow in those footsteps. We should not be afraid of challenging the tradition when we feel the tradition uh, gets things wrong. And this is what I think we should be uh, doing also uh, in this particular case. Uh, mm. I've spoken probably too much already, so I will pass it back to you again, Venerable Chanda. So, uh, and I will yeah. pass it on to Venerable Pekka. What do you think about this? <laughs> Do you think it's important that women not only have an opportunity in monastic life, but have the opportunity for the full ordination? And have you experienced a benefit to that in your practice? <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, I have been living in uh, a bhikkhuni community, which I joined the monastery in 2009, and it was, has been a bhikkhuni community since then. So when I first uh, wanted to ordain, I had no idea about bhikkhunis. Probably nobody had any idea about bhikkhunis. It was 2009, admittedly. Mm -hmm. um, and all I wanted to do was wear a brown robe and <laughs> shave my head and live in the forest. <laughs> so the, uh, what was important at that time was just having the conditions. I just want to meditate. <laughs> And, uh, and that is what uh, most women, I guess, when they ordain, want, just to have the conditions to practice. And so at that time, uh, the community in Perth, which was actually very progressive mm -hmm. already, it was set up by the Buddhist society to be an independent um, uh, monastery. So even at that time, even though they were not bhikkhunis, we ran our own monastery, made our own decisions, had our own abbot. The, uh, the uh, Ajahn Vayam at that time, the spiritual director is a monk, the assistant spiritual director is the abbot of the nuns' monastery. So it was already a uh, very progressive um, setup. But um, so, anyway, somewhere on the line, it came up time to be a bhikkhuni. And I went, oh, well, then. <laughs> I might as well, <laughs> since everybody else seems to be. I was absolutely not interested in being a bhikkhuni. I was, <laughs> um, but uh, um, so uh, yes. Uh, so along with everybody else at the monastery, I <laughs> I became a, I I ordained as a bhikkhuni. Now it is uh, going to be going to be our tenth reigns. It was about five years into living in the monastery that, that uh, we took bhikkhuni ordination. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, this pite, it, the value of higher ordination, like I said, the community that we lived in was very progressive and we did have a lot of um, con good conditions for practice, but the benefit of the higher ordination as opposed to just good conditions which a, a lot of women perhaps do find in um, Meiji communities or, I don't know, Dasisil Mata's 10 precept communities in, in, in Sri Lanka, um, what the difference was to take higher ordination. And um, really, it was unexpected. Because I was not interested, so it was all a bonus, was that... Uh, you don't realize it until you ordain the benefits. That's, I was completely a surprise to me, but there were benefits. I guess <laughs> um, it was just all of a sudden keeping 311 rules, you had to keep the rules. You couldn't fudge some of them and say, oh, well, that piece of chocolate was in my pocket for the last two weeks, I'll fish it out and <laughs> anyway, those are minor rules, but um, keeping the party mocha, so uh, uh, we, uh, as, as, as 10 precept nuns, you don't keep the party mocha, but when you keep the party mocha, you have to keep the party mocha. So that meant, you know, yeah, a very much uh, higher standard of sila, which is so good for the practice. That was, um, you, you have to be so much more careful about what you say, what you did, where you, you know, where you hung around, um, that just simply made you more uh, restrained 
and more, uh, well, your mind is just much, just can't go to certain places because you, you just can't do it anymore. Uh, so keeping a very much higher standard of sila has helped my practice, despite myself. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing was actually having a community that lived by the, by the, the rules of the vinya, because if you don't have the, the vinya as you your... Do you want to translate vinya? Oh, sorry, vinya. So I guess this, uh, the the sangakamas or the rules that a community, how would you say? The monastic the rules training. and regulations. Okay, monastic, monastic, monastic training rules. Training rules. Regulations, yeah. training. training rules. So there's the rules, the individual yeah. rules, but also how the community should operate. That is how we make decisions, who gets to ordain, um, who's the boss, who, who decides who gets a piece of soap and who doesn't. <laughs> 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 all these rules, if you didn't have, uh, so we all of a sudden had to start following the veneer properly as opposed to have just structures that kind of worked. And, and what happens is it, it depends on the, like say, if you had just a group of nuns keeping eight precepts, it just depends on the leader, whether they handle money, they decide to handle money or not, or, you know, all these kind of uh, um, just variation. Who makes the decisions? Is there an abbot? All this is very random, and you, there is no guidance, and there's, you know, room for perhaps, well, corruption or just not a high standard, perhaps, but when we had to keep the 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 uh, uh, run the monastery according to Vinaya principles, we had to tighten our belts. <laughs> we could. Ajahn Bhavali has given us many, many lectures on sangha kamas, how to make decisions, who makes the decisions, and it has made the community very successful. I would say it, the, the nuns' monastery in Perth. We've had to. Um, think, um, uh, be open to, you know, running the monastery differently to how it was run before. Um, yeah, be much more uh, um, inclusive in making decisions. And I don't know, it's just a very much better way to, to run a monastery that has changed mm -hmm. over the last 10 mm -hmm. years that the monast well, 10 years since the current abbot was the, um, I think it's about 10, 10, yeah, years? I think, yeah, 10, I think so. yeah, yeah. 10, 11 years. Yeah. So that has been just the working life of a bhikkhuni as opposed to just a, 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 a 10 precept nun or whatever right. it is, that it does make it a much more um, harmonious. I don't know, harmonious and well-run mm. mm. op operation. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if I could add something, actually, from my experience to yeah. that, which is around the psychological and spiritual benefits, mm. too, because there are definitely practical ones that I mm. see with, you know, being able to have a sort of standardized system that the Buddha laid down, right? So this is like a training system and a whole... Um, um, ideology, if you like, of decision making that's very democratic and very inclusive, as you were saying, mm. right? And um, it's interesting because some of you here, I mean, perhaps from non Buddhist cultures, might think the word restraint and kind of keeping all the rules really strictly sounds a bit restrictive and maybe a little bit even oppressive. But for me, I think the experience is that it's very freeing, you know, to be able to actually take up the training that the Buddha himself said is the fastest way to enlightenment, right? And for me, a lot of happiness came from that. And I think at the psychological level, I also started off as um, a nun in Myanmar, actually, on eight precepts. And I had amazing conditions with a teacher who I had confidence in as someone who'd seen the Dhamma and who treated me as a daughter, a spiritual daughter, and gave me all the conditions, including a kuti to practice in, you know, the best food they could get. I mean, it was village food, it was difficult, and mm -hmm. I, I did become quite ill. 
but it was the best they had, you know, and the conditions. And he'd say to even supporters, he'd say, make sure the nuns get some, you know, or if some mosquito net, like we used to meditate on mosquito umbrella things in the forest, and there'd be, say, four offered to the monastery, he'd say, give it to the nuns because they're practicing well. You know, so he'd direct things our way, which is, you need a good ally to do that, right? <laughs> Someone who sees the value of your practice. So in many ways, I had it good. And like you, I didn't really think about the idea of full ordination because it just wasn't even an option in my mind, you know? And in a way, I'd ordained from my heart. And I know a lot of women say that this is the most important thing for them. It's the ordination, the renunciation, actually comes from the heart it's like a giving up a giving away a giving one's life to the dhamma right so it's something very beautiful wholehearted and and it takes many many years actually to be able to um you know be so sort of single-minded that that is one's aspiration that the conditions eventually can come about um but even so it was when i got sick and had to leave that monastery i realized there was no actual structure in place for the continuation of my monastic life. There was no kind of container that you fall into the way you would as a monk. So as a monk, you would have monasteries in every corner of the world, even the West, right? Many. I mean, you might think, well, four or five is not enough, but you know, <laughs> in this country, there's, well, at least four or five just in one tradition and many, many more, you know, Theravada places that men can go. But for me, there was nothing, actually. And I realized, gosh, I'm in trouble. My monastic life's in trouble. And I spent a couple of years as an itinerant nun just wandering from monastery to monastery, retreat center to retreat center, lay friend to lay friend, if they give me a space to practice. And um, eventually, I heard Ajahn Brahm uh, about Ajahn Brahm. First of all, it was the Dhamma teachings that attracted me. And then I heard that he was uh, helping women claim their rightful inheritance from the Buddha <laughs> by enabling them to take the full ordination again with his support. And uh, my heart just leapt, you know, it was like, <gasps> because inside you were already a bhikkhuni, but you didn't have the actual support. You didn't have the actual, um, you hadn't been formally invited into the Sangha as a member of the Sangha who are considered worthy of support and who can operate their own communities on their own terms and receive, you know, arms, which we basically depend on for our existence, right? Um, and so I thought, well, you know, of course, if I had the chance, this would be the most amazing thing to do. And um, I think what I've observed over the years is that it can be okay to take a another kind of ordination in the beginning, and it can be fine for the practice. It can be fine to practice as a layperson. You can go much of the way, right? But if you have this aspiration for kind of full awakening, to be in a lesser vehicle simply because you're female, <laughs> you know, to take only a partial ordination is actually very demoralizing. And it has a psychological impact over time. And I know from communities where monks and nuns do live together, but with the nuns have a, actually, let's use the word, inferior ordination platform. They're not inferior. Their renunciation, their sincerity and their commitment is not inferior. But the actual training opportunities are not the same. Over the years, especially as they become senior, they start to feel unvalued. And this has a psychological impact. I don't know if anyone's seen the brown, is it? Oh, no, it's the class A, the class B children. Have you seen this documentary where a class is split into two groups and they actually put similar intelligence kids in class A and class B. In fact, they're measured to be pretty much the same in terms of academic uh, uh, capacity. But they call one class A and one class B. And the kids think, the kids in class B think that they're not as good. And then they start underperforming. They start, you know getting lower grades and the class A kids really start to fly. But they're the same. They've got the same potential. And that's the tragedy of this, I think, that when any group, right, is not given the same opportunities, not only don't they achieve the potential they have, they also start to believe there's something different about them, there's something wrong with them. And that's like a vicious circle. 
Because if you think you're not going to be good enough, then you're not. <laughs> right? And this is the problem with discrimination. We can say it's not discrimination, you know, but frankly, as a female or anybody, probably there's a lot of people here who are not white, who are not privileged, you know, as white straight men maybe are. And, you know, sure, everyone suffers, right? But for people from more marginalized communities, I mean, it's really difficult because you struggle more for the same uh, opportunities and that wears us out, it wears us out. And then <laughs> we can't perform the same, right, as people with so many opportunities. And that perpetuates the idea that we're not as competent. So for this reason alone, that's just one reason, I think um, it's vital, you know, that uh, all people can have the same opportunities in whatever sphere of life they wish to take. But especially when it comes to something like awakening, for me, that's particularly painful when it's not there. You know, I can understand if I have a job in the lay world where maybe I'm on a slightly different salary. It, it, yeah, it might affect my material life, but it won't affect my chances to end suffering, right? But when it comes to Buddhism, and when that's a problem there, it, it, it's... Well, what can you say? <laughs> you can't say that the Buddha would be rolling in his grave because he's actually gone to cessation. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, if he hadn't, <laughs> I think he would be. So, yeah, that's another aspect of it, I think, that maybe is only possible to understand as a woman. I don't know. What do you think, Herjan Vermali? Can I make things a little more controversial? Because you said today <laughs> you <laughs> something it, yeah. that was a bit interesting, that <laughs> you would probably rather be reborn as a male if you had another <laughs> chance. <laughs> and I thought that was very honest, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. Well, I think, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how, how interesting it is. I think it's just what you're used <laughs> to, you know? You're used to that, and so you kind of want to carry on. It's probably yeah. just an old habit, that's all. I don't know if it's... Uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah. I'm not sure if there's much more to it. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but uh, it's true. I mean, it's obviously true that from a Buddhist perspective, if you want to be a monastic, you are better off as a as a male. That's for sure. Right, yeah. right. And I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, and mm. uh, so, uh, and this is why you know one of the things that I always uh, feel is that uh, it's so important to remember that from a Buddhist point of view, we have been all of these people before. Yeah, you've been a female before. You've been, you've been a male before. Uh, and so if you are going to discriminate against somebody because you have been these people before and you may very well become them again in the future, it's all there inside of you waiting to come out. Uh, so who are you really discriminating against? You discriminate against yourself, right? Uh, There's kind of madness to discriminate against anyone uh, because we are all these things at the same time. Uh, and I think this is kind of, it's also very, um, it's a nice way of thinking about things because instead of thinking about oppressor and the oppressed, uh, we have all been oppressors, we have be all been oppressed in the past. Uh, and sometimes we just switch, switch roles. Uh, so for that reason, we should all look after each other, understand this kind of dynamic which is always moving around. Uh, and uh, for this is, I think, a very good reason for being, having compassion for everyone and giving everyone an opportunity because ultimately, you're giving yourself an opportunity to do that. Uh. Sometimes we joke among the bikunis that um, the monks who are anti-bikuni, they might be reborn. Yeah, you're right, exactly, you never know. <laughs> As not having a chance to ordain. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I think that was one of my ideas in having this discussion, was sort of, so we can learn more about one another's perspectives, because obviously in Buddhism we, we know, we understand any meditator, right? You don't have to be in Buddhism or Buddhist or whatever. Any person, any human being who cares to look inside will know that they experience suffering and they will see that many of those causes come from within, right? And we all have different types of suffering, but sometimes don't quite understand the other and think, oh, you know, they're okay, they've got it this way, I haven't, blah, blah, blah. But when we hear from one another and we realize that we all have, you know, certain difficulties and maybe also certain benefits, right? Mm. Um, in the bodies we're in. Mm. Maybe it's sometimes harder to be in a female body or a black body or a gay body. Well, you don't have a gay body, but, you know, a, <laughs> if you're a transgender person, there can be a lot of dysphoria. It can be very difficult. And we have transgender people in our communities that we're trying to give opportunities to. And um, I think that's incredible, very laudable, actually. And I know that um, in your monastery in Perth, that's happening. And uh, hopefully it can happen here, too. Um, yeah, what was I saying? 
we all have suffering. We all have suffering, suffering right? Suffering and I think there's a real value to that sometimes, as long as it's not too much to be able to work with. And sometimes I feel like you also asked today, like, would we be choose to be female again? And, and I think I would, you know. And you said you thought it was actually better. To be better. better like and I don't know. What do you, why do you think that, actually? Because it's interesting, because I just think it's the wise approach, right, to not say one's better or the other's better, but to say whatever experience we have, we can make use of. Mm. in a way to extend that compassion to others like ours. You know, we, we have more of an understanding of each other, right? If we share an experience, a common experience. So I wonder if that was part of what you meant. Yeah. And the other thing we were talking about is as when you experience something in a particular way, someone else who has similar ex a, a similar uh, another Sri Lankan or another mm. female will go, oh my goodness, this person also is like me. I can relate to that person. And we were, mm. um, and that's what women become. They are a role model to other women, to future generations. Right. That they say, gosh, she can do it. Why can't I? You know, why can't I ordain as well? Mm. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. 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 Do you have any role models in mind from the bikini? Well, uh, yes, Samyuta? yes, 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 <laughs> yes. We were talking about today Patachara, and Venerable Chanda has a very beautiful statue of Patachara, who does make statues of female bhikkhu arhans, but she has a statue of Patachara. Who knows the story of Patachara? Oh, good, good, good. I can tell the story of Patachara. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, um, she was a, apparently a very beautiful woman, woman who ran away with a, a slave, I think the slave in the household. Anyway, they were living in the forest, living happily, and uh, she, was a, she had a child and was going to have, I think, her, her second child and was returning to her family home, who she had run away from. She had run away, obviously, she had run away with the slave man, so... Um, she was returning to her um, parents' house to uh, have her second child. Anyway, as I remember the story goes, um, she was, uh, her husband died. What happened? Her husband. She was about to give birth. She was. About and she asked her husband to make a shelter. So he went out to get some firewood or something like or some wood to make a shelter. Yeah. And he got bitten by a right, snake. Right, 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 right. So that's and right. died. And died. So anyway, so she had to return. Ah, she had had her. She had had. She had had a small baby, and she was returning with her, uh, the two children to her family home. Anyway, she had to cross a very large river, and in the crossing of it, one child, the little baby, she was carrying the little baby, and a vulture came down and swooped the baby out of her hand. So that baby got taken away by the vulture. And the other child, who was still on one other, the first side of the shore, saw his mother waving her hands in the air think, and thinking that she was calling him to come into the water, walked into the water and was swept away. So in grief, she returned to her family home and found that her parents' ancestral home was burned to the ground, and her parents had passed away. So in that one single event, she had lost her husband, two children, and parents, so was, um, went mad, mad with grief, and came across the Buddha. Um, so, well, she was also pretty <laughs> amazing, heard the Buddha's words, which was, what was it? Be mindful, was it? Was it? Uh, right, yeah, now you are like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it says what he taught her, but she later was watching the water flow down the hill. Do you remember that? And she was seeing the stream right, flowing down right. and washing her feet. Ah, was it yeah, her? Okay. Yeah. 
Ultimately, she became an arahant, <laughs> as all these stories go. <laughs> but the point is that she became one of the greatest teachers simply because she had under, she attracted other women who had lost children, which was commonplace in that day, and was able to um, teach other women like no other woman would be able to because she had been through that very suffering. Um, so that's what, as, as um, human beings, we have to somehow see, see the other, see, see it happening. And somehow that helps us to, um, that helps us to think we can do it too. They did it, I can do it too. Um, which I think, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the importance of having female monastics that other women think, wow, I can do it too. Yeah, and yeah. also this, um, there's a lot of places in the suttas that talk about um, all the great disciples of the Buddha, the great female disciples. And I'd like to make this point because I think sometimes we can pigeonhole women into a particular role. <laughs> you know, we can say, well, we need women as well because they're good at compassion. Or we need women as well because they're good at teaching children or they've, you know, <laughs> suffered the loss of children. Or, and this is what we say about a group when we don't know the individual members, when we don't value people in and of their own right. We're still seeing them as a group, right? We don't name them by, like, famous names. And um, one of the interesting things in the Buddhist texts is that the Buddha had his chief male disciples, but he also had his chief female disciples. And one of the lovely things there is that they were all... Um, had the name of kind of the agga means like the the foremost in a particular quality so there was someone and patachara became the foremost in actually the monastic training the training i like to call it the restraint in tra training in restraint uh, and she became the foremost in that which is extraordinary because she'd actually lost her mind completely at one point and lost all sense of herself and then she became extremely uh, um, brilliant in training her mind, right? And then there were other disciples who were foremost in psychic powers, the Venerable Upalavanna. She was like the, the best in psychic powers among the Buddha's female bhikkhuni disciples. There was Kema, who was the foremost in wisdom. There was Venerable Dhammadinna, who was the foremost in teaching the Dhamma. There was Venerable Kisargatami, who was foremost in wearing rag robes. So she was very austere, very skinny. You know, she wasn't talked about as being beautiful or having, I don't know, she had lost a child, but her main quality in, as a monastic was that she was very ascetic and very contented with little, right? So quite tough. There were women by my name, one of them, Bhikkhuni Chanda, who was Patachara's disciple, and she went forth in old age. Uh, and part of the reason she did this, and it's not my reason, <laughs> promise, is that she couldn't actually afford to live. She didn't have food, and she was wandering around without any, basically starving, right? Very old. And then she saw another nun, I forget if it was Patachara at that point, who was getting arms food and thought, I should be a nun because then I can get food. But of course, she got hold of the teachings, and, and she actually became one of the great disciples of whom we have her name, you know? And I think this is important too, because we're not just talking about men and women or any kind of group here. We're talking about like representation, representing as many different people as we possibly can, so that we have as many different qualities and strengths in the Buddhist community, whether monastic or lay, as we possibly can, right? So everyone can find somebody that speaks to them or somebody that they can relate to, somebody who, you know, just call that just opens their heart because you can hear the same teachings from different people and sometimes it's just the way it's put or a particular maybe comic connection that you have with someone and it can just bring it to life and i think that's you know the beautiful thing about being different you know that we do have different experiences we can't just say well it's all non-self there's no difference difference is good you know in my mind difference is to be celebrated and and, you know, it can really enrich. And one man in Norway actually said, redeem Buddhism. I thought that was beautiful. Yeah, he was making a point. He was saying that he could see the hard work I'd done here in England to try to start something. 
but that it wasn't just about this. It wasn't obviously about me. It was having female monastics who can take the full ordinations actually redeeming Buddhism as a whole. Because without that whole, you know, the fourfold assembly, the male and female and non-binary and every being, <laughs> every member of the lay community, without every member of the monastic sangha, it isn't a whole. Something's missing, you know, and it actually can't stand up. It can't last. So I thought that was very beautiful, and it gave me a big picture, you know, that it put my own struggles really into perspective. Because mm. this is really about making the teachings available. That's what it's about. Mm. Mm-hmm. And helping to people to feel that, yeah, these teachings are for me too. I too can progress on the path. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I guess we've said quite a lot, and I wonder if there are any... Um, if it might be time to open, or, or is there anything sure. else? Yeah. No, that's a good, good Is it time, time, a good yes, time to yeah. open yeah. to some yeah. discussion and yeah. maybe... We haven't, uh, had, we haven't had any arguments yet. Arguments. Yeah, yeah. Or, that was the time. Yeah. yeah, maybe you completely disagree. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're all sort of on the same page in different, you know, we have different experiences, but we're not really a debate, is it? Because <laughs> we sort of agree. But maybe that's some of you don't, and maybe there's more we can address to kind of go into areas that are a little bit more unclear or yeah. harder to navigate somehow. Yes. Uh, it seems like a lot of anti bhikkhuni sentiment, especially among monks, uh, comes out of a, comes from cultural bias rather than anything within traditional belief. And I'm just wondering, isn't that rather alarming and doesn't it point to a generalized failing of Buddhist monasticism if there are so many monks who act more out of cultural biases than out of understanding of Dhamma or wisdom and compassion? And um, then it follows that if there's that big of a problem at the core of Buddhist monasticism, should we really be so concerned with getting into it? Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. Can I actually start just by saying I think there's two ways we can deal with it. And one is to say, well, it's rotten to the core, (laughs) so I'll just stay away. And there's another thing we can say, which is, okay, well, it's gone off course. What if I change it from the inside? What if I can do something to actually, you know, bring out the whole purpose of monasticism? which is, in my mind, to kind of understand the Buddha's teachings and to take them on board as far as we possibly can. And um, so I don't think we should write anything off. And whilst I do think that's largely true, I would definitely nod my head to a lot of that, there is also a lot, there are a lot of good monasteries too, where people do base their practice on the early Buddhist teachings and they do have more of a progressive approach. And I'd also kind of like to suggest that bhikkhunis have an advantage here because we don't have as much cultural baggage. We Mm. don't belong to the Thai Sangha. We don't belong to the Burmese Sangha. We don't belong even to the Sri Lankan Sangha if you're Sri Lankan because we took bhikkhuni ordination with new bhikkhuni teachers and monks who support that. We didn't take it in countries or cultures that are unanimously for that. So nobody sort of sees me and says, oh, she's our non. You know, if you're a monk ordained in the Thai tradition, they're like, oh, they're, they're our monk, you know, and all the Thais will come and support you because you're, wearing, you're in the Thai tradition. I think that's your experience. That's your experience in Perth to a large degree. <clears throat> but as a bhikkhuni, you're just a bhikkhuni, and there's this gap where we haven't acquired that cultural baggage, which is difficult on the one hand in terms of getting the support, but it also gives us a kind of much clean a slate to actually start attracting people, hopefully, because of our practice and because of our, um, yeah, just our sincerity in the practice and what we can offer, and that's up to people to decide. Mm -hmm. So what I've noticed in my little community here, which is most of you, actually, I mean, it's not big, right? And I'm very pleased about is that we don't cater to just one group. We actually don't at all. It's very, very mixed, and there's not more of one culture than there is of another. The absent culture, completely absent, is the Thai culture so far for me. So I would really like to welcome any Thai support or Thai supporters who may be listening to this 
just because we want inclusivity. Yeah. So I don't know. Could you speak to that? Yeah, Would you like to speak to yeah. that? Yeah. Would you like to? Do you have any? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, not, no. I, yeah. Yeah. Because it's about, it's about okay. I guess, when you ask the question, okay. were you thinking more about the bhikkhu sangha? Mm -hmm. Because I guess there aren't enough bhikkhunis to have... I'd have to admit, I haven't seen much anti-bhikkhuni sentiment in the bhikkhuni sangha. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I would just to add, it also has brought bhikkhunis from other traditions mm -hmm. together as well, like in our... Uh, monastery there are a lot of Chinese nuns who come and we realize we actually if you practice the same vineyard 2000 years later when a Chinese nun from Hong Kong comes and stays with the yeah, I guess Theravada bhikkhuni we are actually doing the same thing so that except for a few bodhisattva and and some weird little things um, we are we can share we can share our practice, and we are actually all bhikkhunis. We are not Sri Lankans or Hong Kongers or Taiwanese. We're actually all bhikkhunis. So that is, we come with no baggage. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. But I think the question, your question was more than mm. just monks who are anti-bhikkhuni. It was about, isn't there something wrong with monasticism at its core? Yeah, if it can get to the point where the basic precepts of monasticism are overpowered by the cultural bias of monks. Mm. Isn't there something wrong in their training? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, the, the thing is that the fact that you have seen it already means that you can ordain, right? Because you understand the difference. So you're, you're okay. You're going to be fine. <laughs> but the, uh, this is, I think, one of the kind of perennial kind of debates in Buddhism, this idea between what you might call the uh, Buddha Vajrana and the Acharya traditions. Acharya tradition is that you follow the tradition of your teacher. And this is kind of what all of Buddhism does. They follow the teacher, and the teacher is not the Buddha. It's never the Buddha. It's just always someone else. <laughs> And this is always very fascinating because I always like to ask in a group of Buddhists, uh, who do you take as your teacher? Uh, and it's always this, this monk, this maybe sometimes this nun, this Rinpoche or whatever. It's very rarely anyone says the Buddha. Actually, never happens. Uh, except I, I sometimes say, maybe I'm a Chanda when I would take and write that. But it's actually very rare. Uh, but it's, the thing is that th these things are changing all the time. Yeah, there's kind of no. It's not as if things are one way or, or another way. It's almost as if there's this kind of ebb and flow, kind of the society goes through a change and then everyone realizes actually we're going too far away from the world of the Buddha. We're becoming purely based on commentaries or teachers or whatever, and now we need to come back again. And this is what the forest tradition in Thailand was in large part about. It was about coming back to the roots of the tradition, going back to the essence again. Uh, and in recent years, there has been a lot of this happening around the world, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka. Sri Lankans have always loved the suit, as a kind of, and, and that's always been very strong there. And Burma has been kind of, I mean, maybe from my point, it may be very interested in the Abhidhamma, but also suit us to some, some large extent. So there's kind of this ebb and flow, yeah, between kind of a charity and then kind of back to the Buddha Marjana. And that stretches back all the way to the time of the Buddha. Right? You go back to the very early days, uh, and they had these arguments. You had, for example, you had the Sarvastivadins and the Theravadins who, were, who, were, um, uh, uh, who debated, and they had these ideas that were too close to eternalism, for example, Sarvastivadins especially, but also Theravadins to some extent. Uh, and then you had other schools who were uh, the Sotrantika school. And Sotrantika school is a sutta school. That's what Sotrantika means. It means a sutta school, yeah? And they kind of say, throw out the Abhidhamma, throw out those things, and come back to the suttas. So this kind of tension between going back to the word of the Buddha versus going more to the kind of more contemporary ideas of the time, commentaries, uh, uh, teachers, or whatever, has always been there within Buddhism. It's always going back and forth. Uh, so the fact that you see the path clearly, yeah, means that you are the right person to kind of uh, <laughs> yeah, carry on that tradition. Yeah? So uh, there's nothing really weird about this. I think we are, just kind of, we are just part of a long history of this thing happening all the time. Uh, yeah. Wow. Should we ah. ask Bante? <laughs> Can we ask Bante? Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you very much for the profound discussion. <laughs> so this is not uh, trying to make a question, but rather than to flesh out the discussion in terms of Buddhist viewpoint of gender, sexuality, and social equality and inclusive class. So 
According to my understanding of Theravada Buddhism, there is a so-called confusion in between the conventional truth and the absolute truth, the Samadhi Satcha and Paramatha Satcha. In the eyes of conventional truth, it is inevitably influenced by the contemporary society, social mm -hmm. beliefs, religion, and many dogmatic slumbers and very authoritative things in the current society. It is, it is absolutely on the ground, it is inevitable. Like in the 6th century of BC in India, the gender, sexuality, and social inequality, this kind of stuff, really terrible and horrible. But unfortunately, it is influenced by them. So it is another matter. But in terms of absolute truth, there is no relevance of being either male or female to enlighten or understanding the real nature of the world, to spread the seeds of compassion, love and kindness, sympathy, equanimity. No need to be a specific person, just to be a human being, that's all. So, for example, with reference to Theravada Abhidhamma, you know very well, Dvigan Bhava, Ikti Bhava, Purisa Bhava. What is Bhava? It is set of nature in human world. So, male or female, the, this sort of gender problem is just a thing of human nature. That's all. The Pali grammar book, which is really ancient, called Saddhaniti Pakaran, what is power? It is a matter of cause and effect. That's all. Mm. So, male and female, it is all about human figure and matter, but not about human wisdom or moral conduct or awareness. So, the essence of Buddhism directly addresses the wisdom, moral conduct, and mindfulness and awareness. That's all. So, on this basis, I would say, in the lens of conventional truth, there could be some confusions, contrasts between gender issues and sexuality with regards to the 6th century BC in India. It goes through the ages from very tradition. But in the eyes of absolute truth, from the point of Theravada Buddhism, I would say there is no place for discrimination in between human beings. It's all about peace and harmony in a spiritual journey. That's all I would say. This kind of my understanding. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in in secular Buddhism, we, we attended the retreat in the school like the secular Buddhism when they addressed the lay people as Sangha. So <laughs> is it um, is it the app and floating or is it like <laughs> completely you know, I don't know, like uh, you know, different you can ask you can you go for it. Okay. Well, I'm just saying what he said. Anyway. <laughs> what I've heard. But um, as I understand, the word Sangha is used in the canon, the Pali canon, to refer, first of all, to the Arya Sangha, like Buddhang Samang Dhammang Sanghang Sadangachami. But it is all, and it is always in reference to the monastic. The, the ordained Sangha. I think one example that's used is that you Anjali, and you don't, un, you are always Anjali to a monastic, to not a to, a, yeah, to an ordained person. So that is an example in the uh, uh, suttas that it is clearly referring to an ordained person. Uh, so, I mean, for the last, I, I, I guess as a traditional Buddhist, it has always been a concept of Sangha was the monastic Sangha. It was never an idea that anyone who practices Buddhism is called a Sangha member. So it's also a new concept. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it all, I think more than anything, it 
sorry, but it also devalues the 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 robe to some degree. It it says that you and I are all the same, which is very nice. But the 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 rules that we keep and the higher vinaya, the uh, virtue. Vir virtue that we have, it is different. It is different. It is a it is a it is worthy of respect. It is a higher training. So that's sort of undermined when anybody's a Sangha member. What do you think? I agree. Uh, yeah. I to that. Sorry, oh, yeah. I read something very recently from a very old Gandhari text uh -huh. from like the second century. It was actually an actual fragment that they found of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra. And there it sort of explains how the four groups of disciples, they all ornament the Sangha. And, and this is quite specific in Gandhara. Yeah. Second century is quite weird. You can read it in the article by Richard Solomon and Alon from 2000. 2000. Yeah. Ah. So it's quite kind of difficult to refute that. It's very early, very early actual fragment. Mm. But that doesn't mean it was. The, the yeah. That, that's early. It's a bit it doesn't really mean it's the Buddha's word. I would like to turn it a little bit into sort of something a bit more relevant for maybe this discussion to say that, I mean, not to go on too much about this, but um, I mean, you know, Sangha can mean community. Sangha can mean. But I think from my perspective, trying to establish a monastery here and trying to bring the Buddha's teachings here, having been committed to learning and practicing them full time for 27 years, because I was 10 years serving around 60 retreats, meditating on around 60 retreats before I ordained. That's a lot of meditation and service and a lot of practice. And um, training as a monastic as well, that um, sometimes, because other people use the word sangha, it almost disguises the fact that we're missing the bhikkhuni sangha. It's almost like the society doesn't realize that there's something missing because they have a sangha oh, I got my sangha every week. I go to my sangha, I go to this teacher or that teacher, which is great, you know. I think it's amazing that so many people in Oxford have communities. They have, like, practice groups that they meditate with, right? But if we call them sangha, then we don't... We forget that there's actually an element to the sangha, especially the bhikkhuni sangha who aren't visible anyway. We become even more invisible because everybody says, I have my Sunday sangha or whatever. It's like... Actually, there isn't a, a full sangha in this country. There's one bhikkhuni in this whole country in the Theravada tradition, and that's me. And that is incredibly difficult. So if that becomes more invisible, it makes it even more difficult. So I think we have to just point to the fact that there's an absence of monastics. And I guess my only trouble with that word really is that it disguises that. Um, and it makes it even harder to like find a place for bhikkhunis in particular in this country. That's one, that's my sort of felt sense of mm. how that word can sometimes be a little bit yeah. detrimental. Did you want to say something to, about that? Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, I can. I, it's I, a sort I, of yeah. side thing. <laughs> I can always say something. Well, I, I, I think what you're saying yeah, about easy. all the four assemblies kind of being a, you know, being something positive, mm. I, I think it's probably true, you know, there's nothing wrong. I think that's exactly right. And I, very quite possibly that was very much the word of the Buddha as well. And if it was in the Gandharan text, then quite likely it was, a, you know, it's something mm. to that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there is no distinction between the monastic sangha and the lay people. There it still is a distinction there. I mean, obviously the Buddha laid this down for a reason. Uh, and for me, the most powerful reason why the bhikkhuni sangha matters is because the Buddha laid it down. He would never have laid it down unless it really mattered. Uh, and if it really matters, then surely we should do what we can to re-establish it. Uh, so I think that I don't think these things are contradictory. I think they are just kind of they're nuances, really. Uh, and that's how I would uh, would, would see that point. Yeah. Can I come to Patsy yeah. just because I'm aware we haven't had a single woman speak? I, I see you've got your hand up too, <laughs> yeah. and I'll come to you eventually. Yeah. But yeah. I'd just like to give some women a yeah. chance because yeah. we haven't actually heard what you feel. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, rather interesting, I, I don't have a Okay, no problem. There are um, treasures that I'm missing in this discussion. Lots of it is very new for me. Yeah. And what I'm trying to get around to saying is I wondered if we could have either a microphone or people would mind speaking 
Instance this was, whether it was Katina? It was um, the Singaporean contingent. We would always be there for Katina. Yeah. Where there would be a big celebration. It's probably the Katina. So this yeah. Um, the ad was uh, Penny Anthony Hikumi yeah. coming from Canada, but I think of Vietnamese origin. Okay. It could be that time. There are some times that I do feel excluded actually, in uh, a little bit. Sometimes I don't mind because I don't like the big crowds. <laughs> but the thing is, it'd be nice to have a choice because sometimes I've been there for the rains retreats and then they have the big katina at the end where everybody kind of goes in to listen to Ajahn Brahm mm. and they get some Dhamma teachings and the nuns aren't allowed in there. They say there's not enough space, but there's like 20 monks or something. <laughs> anyway, you could yeah. sit on the corner. Yeah. I'm sure you could. I mean, I don't mind, actually, yeah. but the point is maybe there should be But there be is a reason for that. Choice. Yeah. Because it's, always, this is, it's yeah, a Sangha Kama. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is a Sangha right. Kama. So this is, ah, okay. this is not the discrimination because okay. it would be the same with the nuns. Uh, okay. So if the nuns were to have that sort of meeting, the monks also are completely excluded because actually it might, it might become problematic if they were there. Oh, for so, a Katina. Uh, uh, yes, because it's a Sangha Kama, consider Sangha Kama. But that may be the reason. I'm not sure what the reason was, uh, but that may have yeah. been the reason. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, mm. it's not enough just to give the full ordination to women. <laughs> because sometimes mm. I can understand that, you know, sometimes the people that do the big act of giving the ordination take a lot of the credit, which is great, and they deserve it. And I totally respect my teachers, Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahmali, and all the... Actually, most of the monks in Perth are very pro bikuni which is wonderful. But, you know, giving the ordination is one thing, creating the conditions that are similar, and not that they have to do it necessarily, but having conditions that are similar to what the monks have with enlightened teachers, lots of access to teachings, going in your place in the arms round, <laughs> according to your own seniority. This takes much longer, and it's only in the last three years, I think, that women could get to stand in their place in the arms line. And this is in one of the most progressive monasteries in the world. So fantastic, they're the only ones that have done it also, right? You can see it like that, but it's so new. So new, like just in the last three years. Before that, I was going at the very back of the arms line every day for lunch. And I didn't used to mind at all, because for me, it's nothing to do with being respected. But once I started the project here, I minded, because I felt like it was almost it was taking something away from the women who supported me by not showing them that I had a very long-term commitment to this path. It was almost portraying myself as a junior when I was actually very experienced. And I felt that that mattered to the female community and to, and to raising the support for the monastery, right? Because if you see other people at the front and it's men, 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 monks, 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 you assume that these are the ones with the knowledge and these are your next teachers. And so they get more support, they get more confidence, etc. So, yeah, it's, it's quite new, you know, but it's changing, and it's changing for the positive. So now when I go there, I'm, like, in my proper place in the line, which is fantastic. Um, but, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do, and I think this is one of the reasons for a debate or discussion like this, because unless men also hear how it is to feel that way and the impact it can have for, for women and for the community at large then they won't realize, you know? They actually won't realize because we're all in our habit. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, 
Okay, and then you, I, yeah. Something like that. And I don't think that's been the only restriction. Right. Something like that, yeah. I mean, because we don't have a lot of time to go into the details. Something like that is the case. But the thing is that the Buddha left a very clear um, way to cover that eventuality, to cover that possibility in the Vinaya. He actually kept uh, a clause in there that said, yes, bhikkhunis can ordain other bhikkhunis, because there were women at that time, women monastics. Mm -hmm. But he also kept in another um, rule that said monks can ordain bhikkhunis. So some people argue that because he later said bhikkhunis can ordain bhikkhunis or should ordain bhikkhunis, that rescinds the previous one. But the Buddha never took... Uh, the other one's still there. Nobody says it's actually not relevant. And I would say he probably left them both there to cover the eventuality that there would be no nuns one day. Because he wants them to be there, right? So there's no argument anymore, um, thanks to scholars like Ajahn Brahmali and Bhikkhu Bodhi. And actually, every like, what I find really interesting is that, the, generally speaking, the monks who are pro Bhikkhuni are the ones who've studied the texts and have a much a practice that's more based on the early Buddhist teachings. And transcended the culture. And they have a deeper practice too, and transcended the culture exactly. Yeah. That's, so. I presume, really where the change is going to have to come from. Um, well, now it's already started. I mean, certainly it's slowing, it slows it down, right, when you have a lot of people sort of continuing to say that it's problematic and then lay supporters get influenced and feel, oh, we better not support the nuns, it might be controversial. Then it does slow things down. But we have bikinis now. We are practising. It's done. <laughs> so it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of, you know, how to keep going and how to, um, yeah, well, get more support. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so first, thank you very much. Um, it's great to attend the talk on this topic. Um, I have one comment on what's been said so far and one question. Um, the comment is, I, I, I haven't, re I don't really understand the distinction made between the Buddha being one's teacher and those corporeally I know in my life as my teacher because where is the Buddha to be found other than being embodied in the present moment in those who are my teachers, those who have written the books that I've read and also ultimately in my own heart. The other thing is, I, I haven't understood, I don't really get the distinction between, it was mentioned, conventional truth and absolute truth. Because, again, where is absolute truth to be found if not in the living present um, within conventional truth? And so, somehow to, to separate the two, 
and to kind of bliss out in absolute truth and deny some of the messiness of conventional truth seems a little bit like living in denial of being alive to the present moment. Um, now the question I want to ask is, just as I and everyone have the seeds of love, wisdom, compassion in me, so do I also have the seeds of greed, hatred and delusion. And I am curious to know how I can better examine my own presumptions, thoughts, preconceptions, and those things which kind of glitter on the edge of my conscious awareness that make me feel uncomfortable or uncertain that are, are kind of presumptions about, oh, um, this is what it should be like and some distinction between um, how it should be for men and not for women. How to kind of see those more clearly because, I mean, for example, I read a bit of Sri Walpola Rahula's book, What the Buddha Taught. Um, and I really didn't like it because every instance of referring to a person, he used he. Yeah. And, I, and I just thought, how can this be relevant to the world we're living in? Yeah. Um, and it was just so overwhelmingly masculine. Um, but as much as I can criticise him, I'm sure that I've got some of those seeds in me. So I'm curious to know what are the reasons that you've encountered and also, I'm not a monk, so maybe more relevant to lay life. What kind of preconceptions lay people might have about gender in Buddhism and who gets to partake in, in ordination and things like that? So, basically, the question is about how to become aware of my own false ideas. <laughs> Come to places like this. Your turn, Ajahn. Both of them. Yeah, I guess uh, hang around with nuns. <laughs> Come and visit us. Uh, well, it's very nice that you at least have that question in your mind, so you are more likely to be open to seeing things in a different way, that itself is a good start. Yeah, get to know, just talk to people, talk to, talk to someone who you would never otherwise speak to, um, and explore in your own mind, I guess, how you react or, or what, why you go, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think the, there are some uh, certain biases and things that are more important than others. Uh, and so a lot of what actually matters is where are you coming from. In Buddhism, it's about whether you're coming from delusion, uh, greed, and anger. This is what really is important in Buddhism. Uh, and someone like uh, uh, Walpola Rahula, he lived, you know, he wrote this book in the 1950s. Uh, and so the idea when you wrote, you always put he in the book. That was the way he, you did things in those days. Uh, you can't really blame him for that. He was just following the conventions of the time, you know. And yes, now it looks really weird. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't think he came from ill will or greed or delusion when he did that. It just was the social, social conventions. Uh, so what you really have to do is you have to reduce your defilements in the mind, you reduce the five hindrances, uh, and as you do that, you will start to see those things that are really problematic in you, and uh, some of the things you will never see because you are also trapped in the social convention of this time. Mm -hmm. In the hundred years' time, they will look back at us and say, we are Neanderthals, what are we doing, <laughs> right? Uh, and, but we can't help being a product of the social, of the circumstance of our time. Uh, and so we can only do our best. Uh, so as long as you do your best, uh, as long as you reduce your defilements, you're doing what you can do in this life. Yeah. Yeah. Is that enough? Do we think that's enough? <laughs> We're almost coming to an end, just to say. So, yeah. Just a comment. Um, do we confuse um, indifference with non-self? <laughs> 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 I did want to kind of get on that, yeah, a little bit, and I do think um, that can happen, yeah.
<laughs> when we say, oh, well, it's all non-self, so it doesn't really matter, gender's irrelevant, you know? And that was sort of how I opened this thing in the first place, because this was what the Bikuni Soma was saying to Mara, right? And this is true at the ultimate level, not that I see things in terms of necessarily that binary way, but this is true idealistically, yeah? And it's true for the awakened mind. But how do we get to that place in the first place if there's so many barriers and obstacles? How do we actually get there? So we have to care. I mean, we can say that non-self is the kind of ultimate doctrine of Buddhism or, you know, um, whatever lofty philosophy you want to use, but the means the whole way through the path is kindness. That's my understanding. My understanding of right view is that it's supposed to bring about a response to suffering that's compassionate, you know? And, and that feeds into the next factor of the path. Having intentions of kindness, compassion, non-harm, you know, non-possession. You could say non-self in a sense, but, you know, um, yeah, not over-identifying, certainly, with our bodies and minds, but understanding that this is the conditions we're in right now, you know, this is what I have to work with right now and how I can I be kind to this because we are conditioned. So it wouldn't be kind for anyone to put themselves in a situation of discrimination. So it won't matter because it's non-self. It's actually because it's non-self, because we're conditioned, we have to be very, very careful about the contact that we have in this world, you know, the way that we relate to one another, the situations we're in. And sometimes for me, I'm in a situation where I am very, very, very marginalized. There's one bikuni in the country, okay? This is very difficult. <laughs> There's no one for me to speak to who shares my experience of being a bikuni here. So I can only tell stories about it and hope that people will believe me, but they won't know, they won't experience what I experience. So they might say I'm exaggerating or it's not really discrimination or because they don't know. So we have to be really compassionate and sometimes we're not able to get out of those situations and they will have an impact and I think it's so important for us to realize it's not personal it's not because of my failing or my weakness it's actually I'm in a difficult situation you know and um, and we have to learn to work with that and no one else is going to understand your experience in your body in this society and you know your particular set of conditions as well as you and people that are maybe closer to that experience so I think, you know, to sort of dismiss it as not self is not kind to ourselves or kind to anyone else, actually. So my experience has actually taught me that perhaps there are things about others that they go through, struggles that others go through that I can't have any clue about. You know, I thought it was, I actually thought it was fine being a woman. I thought it was easy. I thought everyone had similar opportunities until I joined the Sangha, which is sad to say. But I'm sure it's the right thing because the Buddha is my teacher. And I want to change that. Yeah. I don't know. So, yeah, I don't think we can bypass our experience. I, I think you're right in the sense that, you know, we have to uh, work with what we have and yeah. make peace with that. Should I say something? Sure, okay. please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> please. No, because I don't want it to kind of, you know, okay. But I, I think the problem is much deeper than that. It's not just about indifference, uh, it's actually false, uh, it's actually the wrong way of mm. dealing with things because it's not true. Uh, because we all come from a sense of self. Uh, it is true from the paramatta Satcha point of view, the ultimate truth is true, but we are not there. We're not actually coming from that point of view, but coming from a point of view where we are male, female, or non-binary or whatever. So we have to deal with that is our reality, so we have to deal with our reality. You can't kind of, you know, somehow compress or, or suppress our reality with some kind of higher teaching. That's actually uh, detrimental, that's a really bad thing to do. So it's actually untrue and it's actually a false way of dealing with these things. And it's called, there's a name for this in the uh, psychological spiritual bypassing. Uh, you're trying to kind of, uh, you know, use a higher reality to kind of somehow uh, overlook our present reality. And that's actually very, very dangerous and it's actually very detrimental. Uh, so I would say it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a bad thing. But I think people do this thing because they find that the question is too difficult or whatever, or they kind of their tradition is so, so they use these things as a kind of an excuse to kind of get out of that difficult situation. So in a sense, you know, you try to always have compassion for people, uh, mm. but in the end, I think it is a false way of dealing with things. So. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Shall we have one last comment from yeah. Venerable here? Just, um, just I just wanted to say, you know, with Jim, I mentioned earlier about the bias, um, the um, cultural bias. Um, 
there was a very well-known Western monk in the forest sangha that I did, discussed this with in 2009, and he explained what the lady questioned earlier. Reason why the end of the lineage, reason why this sort of system it mustn't continue, um, because the lineage has been broken. So you know, as you pointed out, the Renai also pointed out different things. Um, but so it's just, that's just to point out, it's not just culturally, because this was a British person that was very strong against yeah. the ordination of the key of beginnings. Um, the good news is that as a monk in the Thai third garden tradition, um, based in Chiang Mai for four years, where there are at least 10, I think it's probably more like 20 in each year, because he's now living together in a temple, they walk arms round, they're treated in the exact same manner by the, by the people on the street. They, when they walk out and run, the people put food into their bar, they respect them, they show respect, just as they did to me as I walked out and run. Um, and I think that's something to be very encouraging um, for all of us. Not only do we have the Ajahn Brahms, the Ajahn Brownleys, and yourselves doing this great work, but it is actually changing in Thailand as well, and it's visible in Thailand. I've even seen Machis walking out and running Bangkok. Um, and again, being treated equally. So that's not to uh, that's not to take away from the hard work that's yet to be done, but just to lend a word of encouragement. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. It's a great note to end on, yes. isn't it? And. Uh, yeah. Did you I, want to close with well, something? I, I just wanted to comment yeah. on one thing yeah. that the Venerable said over here. And I think just because you are a Westerner doesn't mean you're not trapped by tradition. Uh, because you belong, you belong to a tradition, and very often you actually belong to an Asian tradition. You become part of that to such an extent uh, that you become an extension of that a tradition and not really independent anymore. Uh, so I think just the fact that you belong, you know, you have grown up in a Western side, it does not mean that you are outside of those traditions. Uh, that's the only point, yeah. 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 Right, yep, yep. Yeah. Great. So, thank you, everybody, for being here, and I hope this has been interesting. And yes, do your round of applause if you win. <laughs>Thank you very much. Oh, should we say something about the project that mm. we're... Do you want to do it, Ajahn? Because I'm so tired now. So You're so tired now? Okay. Yeah, my throat hurts. Much, uh, okay, so... Okay. Uh, so we'll say a few words. Yeah, we'll just say a few words about what we're collecting but, but Pekka, today, would, yeah. would you like to... So, should I say something? Or a bit yeah. Of yeah. Okay, I can. Okay. Why not? All right, then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I... I'm usually given this job. It's actually a very nice job. It's a very pleasurable job, actually, to be able to kind of say something nice about the, uh, the Bikunis and everything, because uh, it has been a very long-running thing that I have been supporting for a long time, and basically for many, many reasons. Uh, and uh, I think, as we just said during this whole uh, session, is that the Buddhism is really lacking something, unless we have all the four assemblies. Uh, and to get the Bikuni assembly back on track is actually very important to get that balance. It is actually part of the vision of the Buddha himself, as we pointed out. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing that's happening here in the UK, and it's a wonderful thing that Venerable Chanda is willing to spearhead something which actually is so difficult to do. Uh, yeah? You by yourself, you kind of have to really stand the ground, uh, and you have to do these things. It's like being a pioneer in many ways, and being a pioneer is always very difficult and very hard work. Yeah? So I would. Um, uh, I would encourage you all to support this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, and I would like to remind that when you're supporting Venerable Chanda and her monastery, you're not just supporting her or her monastery, you're supporting a big vision of what Buddhism is about. Yeah? A, a kind of big thing happening around the world. Uh, and when you think about it in that way, actually it is a beautiful and wonderful thing that you, you would be supporting if you support this. Uh, and it kind of is a help not only for the bhikkhunis, it is a help for uh, the monks as well, because it means we get less uh, work teaching. <laughs> 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 well, self-interest. It means that it, is we, are, we are supporting millions of people around the world because these teachings reach so many people, right? It is wonderful. We are reducing the suffering in the world, increasing the happiness, uh, and there's so many thing, good things that come out of this. And when you support this, uh, you have a little bit of that. Yeah? You take, have a little bit of part uh, of creating more happiness in the world and reducing the suffering in the world. And what a marvelous thing that is. Uh. So please think about it like that, because then it really becomes something powerful, something very beautiful. Uh. And you, if you support this project, you also will benefit enormously from that. Uh.
So that is all I would like to say. So, yeah. yeah. And I'd just like to thank you again for coming all this way yeah. to show your support and to be part of this little bit. We were all a little bit like, ooh, don't know what we're going to talk about today. It's like a little bit, ooh. And uh, also Venerable Lupeka. And just to say that, yeah, whatever I'm doing is supposed to be for the benefit of as many people as possible. So there are different ways to be involved. You can take one of our leaflets. You can come and offer food. You can come and practice with me and at the moment with Venerable Lupeka. We do a lot of things on Zoom as well, online teachings. And uh, we have opportunities for people to volunteer and just be involved as part of a community. I know quite a few of you, but it's still small. And I think in the beginning, things take a while, but we're sort of gathering a bit of a, a community now whereby I'm not the one supporting you alone. You're supporting each other as spiritual friends. And that's so nice to see. And uh, yeah, we have some of our friends here people who've stayed with us, people who are for Dana, and it's just very touching, actually, to see the goodness and support that there is. So I feel very grateful to be in Oxford, where we can have such debates, and um, where there's so much openness to this. So thank you very much, and I uh, hope to see you somewhere soon. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good, that was great actually. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Yeah.